this is a rather stylized drawing of the abdomen, which I hope will help you to understand how the mesenteries and various spaces in the peritoneum arise. If you can imagine this tube here in the middle, which shows uh, a rather worm-like structure with a green line running through the middle, a green line is supposed to represent the abdomen, the, the gut going through the abdomen, this end over here being the mouth end, and the end line over here being the anal end. <clears throat> then the blue space surrounding the green gut represents the peritoneal cavity. In all the diagrams of this tube that we'll see in this presentation, always remember that this part over here is the dorsum and that this part over here is the ventral aspect. Or in other words, this is posterior and this is anterior. <clears throat> we can further subdivide this tube up into a number of areas which I've colored in in slightly different greens here. This light green bit over here, that wasn't supposed to be moved, let's put it back where it was. This light green bit over here represents the small part of the abdominal esophagus. Um, we're only talking about four centimeters or so of, of length, and it also represents the stomach. The next darker green bit over here, that's going to be the duodenum. This next bit over here is going to be, guess what, correct, it's going to be small bowel, and in this case we're just referring to the jejunum and the ileum. The next dark green bit, that refers to the colon. And in this case, we're looking at the ascending colon. Not writing that very clearly. The ascending colon, transverse colon, descending, and finally the sigmoid. And then the last tiny little bit at the end here, that's going to be the rectum. I haven't included the anus as a particular structure on this in this section. So if you can just remember those divisions, then that will help us in understanding the next slide. In this slide, I've drawn in some blue structures here, which represent the parts of the bowel where mesentery is found. Now. You will remember that in the previous slide I said that this was the dorsal aspect, this was the uh, ventral aspect, this was the ventral aspect of the, of the tube. Situated over here is a dorsal mesentery. And that dorsal mesentery attaches to the stomach, and it goes just onto the first part of the duodenum here. Now the first part of the duodenum um, is in the process of going retroperitoneally as it arches from coming out of the stomach, out of the pyloric canal, as it attaches to the pyloric canal, and then bending over backwards, angulating itself around the anterior surface of the vertebral column so that it can run down retroperitoneally. The stomach in the first part of the duodenum also has a ventral mesentery. So this is a ventral mesentery. A ventral mesentery. The next part, um, this region of the bowel here that I'm illustrating with the green arrow, you'll see that there is no ventral mesentery 
and there is no dorsal mesentery. So there's no blue stuff there, or dark blue stuff there, and there's no dark blue stuff there. That represents where the duodenum is, in other words, the second, third, and fourth parts of the duodenum, which sit retroperitoneally, and therefore there's no um, mesentery to attach them uh, as intraperitoneal structures. We come then into the next section over here, which represents the small bowel, the jejunum, and the ileum. That's over here. And here we have a dorsal mesentery going all the way uh, along the length of the small intestine up to the ileocecal junction. So that over there, that point there, is ileocecal junction. Then the dark bit over here is typically retroperitoneal, and that represents the ascending colon. This here with the dorsal peritoneum is going to be the transverse colon with its mesentery, transverse colon with its mesentery, known as the transverse mesocolon, so that the transverse mesocolon is very mobile and can dip up and down uh, in the abdomen. It's not held up against the posterior abdominal wall. Next section over here, retroperitoneal structure, is going to be the descending colon. The descending colon. And this little bit here, with its mesentery, is going to be the uh, sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon then progresses further on to become continuous with the rectum. And the last little terminal light green area over here, which uh, you can see here, this little light green bit here. Sorry, this little light green bit here. That little light green bit... Uh, represents the rectum, and there's no mesentery attached to that, so the rectum is a retroperitoneal structure. Coming back then to the, uh, origi the shape of the original tube, we can see then that in this region here, which is in the foregut, this is the only part that has a ventral mesentery. All the rest of the GIT, where it has mesentery, it's all dorsal mesentery. However, in this region of interest over here, uh, where we have the, the stomach and duodenum, first part of the duodenum, we can see here that I've drawn in a little extra bit here. Get it in the right place. A little extra bit here, which represents the liver. And this liver is clearly arising in the ventral mesentery. If we enlarge this even further, then this section over here, this bit between the liver and the gastrointestinal tract, or the, the gastrointestinal tube, rather, that there is going to form the lesser omentum. Lesser omentum. And if I enlarge it even further, this bit over here, Pardon. This bit over here is going to form the falciform ligament. In this view, you can see the tube again with the foregut, midgut, and hindgut delineated um, as follows. Uh, the foregut um, terminates then halfway through the duodenum and is supplied by the celiac trunk, which is a branch of the aorta. The midgut extends then from the first, uh, from uh, halfway through the duodenum to the transverse colon, two thirds of the way across the transverse colon, and that is going to be supplied by the superior mesenteric artery, and then the hindgut, which is from where the midgut finishes off to the end of the tube, that is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. And so in this slide, uh, you can see over here that this bit of retroperitoneal uh, bowel uh, corresponds to the second, third, and fourth parts of the duodenum. This little bit over here is where the first part of the duodenum is as, as it comes out of the, or as it is continuous with the pylorus and then starts to uh, run retroperitoneally, joining up with the second, third, and fourth parts. 
Uh, this bit over here represents the jejunum and ileum. This retroperitoneal bit here, the ascending colon, coming into the transverse colon over there. Uh, descending colon over there. Uh, sigmoid colon there. And rectum there. Now, I'd like to look at a slightly different view of this tube and draw another diagram to what it would look like in cross-section. Now, if you can imagine this gastrointestinal tube um, before the development of the uh, intestines and the stomach and the foregut derivatives, and one was to do a cross-section of this, then we might see something like this, which represents uh, the outside. This would be the outside of the of the developing embryo. This would be the equivalent thing on the other side there, that line and that line. And on the inside, we've got a dark blue line, which represents the peritoneal lining, going all the way around and creating this space here in the middle, which is referred to as the peritoneal space. Now, gastrointestinal contents do not develop within the peritoneal cavity itself, but they arise in the extraperitoneal space, which is around here. It could be, in this case here, arising from the dorsum, and in some cases in front of the liver, in the uh, uh, foregut, it's going to be the partly uh, the liver arising from vascular supply in this particular region. Now, if it was to do a cut through the tube at the point where I've drawn that, here, uh, that red line and see what it looked like in cross-section, what would we see? Looking over here at the duodenum, just this bit here, we can see that it lies flat up against the posterior abdominal wall. So in the diagram below, we would expect to see this bit of duodenum, developing duodenum, arising from the posterior abdominal wall, um, arising retroperitoneally, and trying, as it grows, to press in towards where the peritoneum lies. And now the duodenum does not grow into the peritoneal cavity, but rather indents the peritoneum from posteriorly. So that if we enlarge this, and then go to have a look at what the peritoneum does, peritoneum will be reflected like this as I'm drawing with the blue line now, will indent and then carry on being continuous with the parietal peritoneum here. But in this region over here, the duodenum, the posterior part of the duodenal wall, is right up against the posterior abdominal wall. And it's that that brings us back to the original picture that shows why this bit of duodenum is up against the posterior abdominal wall and the tube over here, as indicated. Of course, the blue color of the peritoneum, that's this bit over here, the peritoneal space, and this light blue space over here, both represent peritoneal cavity. So, we'll label this cut up over here. We'll call this A up here and we will call this cut down here, we will also label A, and we'll keep a record of that so that we know what's going on. Now we'll do a second cut, and we'll do that through this position here, and we will call that B so that we can keep a record of the different cuts that we're doing. Call that B. So what are we going to expect to find at B? Well, as before, we've got a posterior abdominal wall. Only in this case, the intestinal or gastrointestinal derivative is now going to be running through the middle of the tube, whereas in the duodenum area, it was running in the posterior uh, abdominal wall space, retroperitoneally. In this case, we're going to see it sitting in the middle. And we anticipate seeing a connection between this bit of bowel here, which in this case is going to be the small intestine, and the posterior abdominal wall by this dark blue structure referred to as a mesentery. And so this is what the cross-sectional area 
uh, of a cut through B will look like. If we were to magnify this up further and have a closer look, what we would see here is the intestine in the middle, uh, sitting just over here. This area is going to be the small intestine. This light blue area represents the peritoneal space, similar to that which we saw uh, anterior to the duodenum. But the big difference here is the presence of a mesentery running from the posterior peritoneal lining, at the posterior peritoneal wall, running round the duodenum, a big bone round the small intestine, and then coming back to continue down onto the peritoneum of the posterior abdominal wall on the other side. We could fill this area in here with blue, and that is the blue that represents the blue that we see in the dark blue space over here on this particular diagram here. Now those two layers of mesentery are not fused together, but in between them they have blood vessels, veins, arteries, as well as nerves that will come from the posterior abdominal wall, in this case it's going to be branches of the superior mesenteric artery that I'm drawing in, coming off the aorta, so the round thing that I'm drawing there is going to be the aorta, and coming down uh, from the uh, abdominal aorta is going to be a branch of the superior mesenteric artery, coming down to supply the embryological midgut, in this case the small intestine, and that brings up the importance of understanding the role of the mesentery. The mesentery, because it carries blood vessels, nerves and lymphatics, is an important source of life for the, in, for the intestine or for the structure which we refer to as being intraperitoneal because it's surrounded almost completely by peritoneum. The mesentery must not get kinked or twisted because if that happens then the blood supply or the venous drainage to the bowel will be damaged and that would result in subsequent death of the, of the intestine. But note here that although we call this intraperitoneal, the structure being intraperitoneal, it's not actually within the peritoneal cavity itself, and the peritoneum is lacking in this area over here. So it surrounds the whole of the organ that is intraperitoneal, except for a small space through which the neurovascular bundle is going to communicate. So it doesn't actually go into the peritoneal space, but is surrounded by peritoneum through around most of its periphery, except for where blood vessels and nerves, etc., must access the organ. So having seen that, how can we now extend our knowledge to defining what goes on at uh, a cut that goes through this position here, which is going through the foregut? and involving the stomach in the first part of the duodenum. And I'm going to call this particular part here C, and we'll have a look and see what that shows right now. Now, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to move B across there and A across there, and that'll leave me space to draw what goes on at cross-section C. Now, the principles are exactly the same. At Cross-section C, what we've got here in the middle, is the gastrointestinal tract, which represents this bit over here. And then posteriorly, we've got a dorsal mesentery. So a dorsal mesentery up here, and the same thing over here, dorsal mesentery over here. So these two represent the same structure. Then we come down to here, we're in the dorsal mesentery. A big part the ventral mesentery that represents this structure over here. So we've got a stomach in the middle, which is the green bit here. We've got a dorsal mesentery going to the posterior part of the abdominal wall here, and we've got a ventral mesentery going from the stomach to the anterior abdominal wall here. The big difference in this particular case is that something starts to develop in this region here. 
and in this case it's going to be the liver. So using the same color coding system as the previous diagrams that we did, this bit over here, which is the stomach, is going to be the equivalent in this diagram over here. This part here, which represents the dorsal mesentery, is represented by this part here in C. And the ventral mesentery over here is represented by this part over here in the tube diagram. So the ventral mesentery runs from the stomach to the anterior abdominal wall. From the stomach to the anterior abdominal wall. You'll remember that in this area here where the dorsal mesentery, uh, beg your pardon, where the ventral mesentery is, that the liver started to develop in this region here. In this ventral mesentery. So that if we go back down to the small diagram over here, or the cross-sectional diagram over here, this part here, representing the liver, appears as this part here in this diagram, representing the liver. And it is attached to the stomach, through a bit of mesentery, and to the abdominal wall by a bit of mesentery. This part of the mesentery here, is referred to as the lesser omentum, and this part over here, joining the anterior abdominal wall to the liver, will ultimately develop into the falciform ligament, both of which are derivatives of the ventral mesentery. So in summary, the cut through A represents what it looks like with retroperitoneal bowel. B, the cut through the part of the bowel that is called intraperitoneal but only has dorsal mesentery. And C, the part of the bowel that has both dorsal and ventral mesenteries. And this refers to the bowel in the foregut which includes the stomach and the first part of the duodenum. Before the full maturation and development of the gastrointestinal tract, one can imagine the abdominal cavity looking like the lower circular diagram uh, in the bottom half of the drawing here, with the light blue area being referred to as the peritoneal cavity. This is one large cavity which subsequently gets divided up into a number of smaller areas by the invasion of the gastrointestinal tract uh, from the retroperitoneum, from uh, anterior abdominal wall, and then also the twisting process that takes place. Thus, a cross-sectional cut through the uh, through the ventral and dorsal mesentery in this region over here, which is in the foregut, would result in a continuation between the anterior and posterior surfaces by a, a dividing line that would include the ventral and dorsal mesenteries. Drawn a little more accurately, that might look something like this. Let's get rid of these. And that's what it might look like. Uh, in this case here, we've got the stomach over here, and we've got the liver over here, dorsal mesentery here, ventral mesentery here. And what I've done is I've colored in the right-hand side of this peritoneal cavity, a darker blue compared to the left-hand side, for reasons that will become apparent now. The gut then starts to undergo uh, a series of rotations. Finally, looking like this last drawing that I've got here. In summary, the liver rotates around towards the right-hand side, and in so doing, it crushes or makes smaller this peritoneal space over here and because it becomes smaller it gets known as the lesser sac. This lighter bit over here gets known as the greater sac because it has got a larger proportion to it. 
but both of these are still part of the single original peritoneal space. I think of looking at the tube from the top, viewing it from the top down, and that's what it would look like in this drawing over here. If we looked at the region where the ventral and dorsal mesentery here lies, over there, we could represent that by drawing a dividing line down the middle of the place where the foregut is, essentially splitting this tube into a left-hand side, which we can see here, that's going to be the left-hand side, and a right-hand side. The right-hand side we can then colour in dark blue colour that we've got in this diagram on the cross-section over here, and the rest of the peritoneal cavity is in the light colour which is represented by this all over here. You can now see then that this area over here, which would refer to as the greater sac, and it's the equivalent of this light coloured area here, this greater sac is continuous with the lesser sac, which is the darker blue colour, represented by the X here on the cross-sectional diagram. And the way to get from the greater sac into the lesser sac is to go around the edge of this dividing membrane, or the ventral mesentery. So the point that I want to make is that the peritoneal cavity was one big cavity originally. It became divided up into parts by the presence of the mesentries, and in this case the ventral mesentery I'm illustrating here. But all parts are interconnected and are actually continuous. Rather like having a house with different rooms, you can go from one room to another, and it doesn't matter whether you're in the sitting room or whether you're in the bathroom or the bedroom, the fact is you're still within the one big house, even though there may be partitions. The lesser sac becomes much smaller than the greater sac then for two reasons. One, because of the rotation of the gut, with the liver swinging towards the right-hand side, and thus compressing the, the space where the lesser sac will form, and also because the liver grows into a very large organ, thus compressing the space um, or the opening between the greater sac and the lesser sac. The communication between the greater sac and the lesser sac is known as the epiploic foramen. So on this diagram on the right here, if you could imagine the liver becoming quite large, you can see that the connection between the lesser sac and the greater sac, that is this little communication here, is much smaller than it was originally before the liver started to enlarge. This gives it an appearance of a hole, rather like the appearance of a hole going into the finger of a glove. It's not really a hole, it's just an evagination of the peritoneal space into the lesser sac region, and there's a narrowing because of the compression by the liver from the outside, giving rise to the appearance of a hole, which is why it's referred to as a foramen. But in fact, it's not a foramen. It's just one big peritoneal sac lined by peritoneum that has different parts to it according to how the gut has folded and the membranes that have formed. So how is this knowledge relevant to clinical practice? On this diagram you can see the liver uh, and its attachment to the, uh, to the stomach from uh, the liver going through onto the lesser curvature of the stomach. And that blue structure there represents the lesser omentum. So a line going from there, continuing round through to this point here. And the falciform ligament, which runs from the anterior surface of the liver 
onto the anterior abdominal wall can be seen on the right hand side on that particular point there. The falciform ligament is formed by an indentation by the ligamentum teres, which we can see here. Um, this slightly darker blue structure, which is the obliterated remnant of the umbilical vein that runs from the placental bed to the uh, liver in the fetus in utero. After birth it becomes obliterated and fibrosed after the umbilical cord is cut. But in the process of going down into the abdomen of the fetus during development it drags down two layers of peritoneum with it which form the falciform ligament. Another part of the uh, lesser omentum is the free edge, this bit over here, and that refers to the attachment of the lesser omentum from the liver onto the first part of the duodenum. This is going to be the first part of the duodenum, which is why it's an intraperitoneal structure just before the rest of the duodenum becomes retroperitoneal. And its importance is that it's three structures, essential structures, for maintaining the liver are found uh, in the free edge of the lesser omentum, and they are the uh, biliary duct, so biliary duct, the hepatic artery, hepatic artery, and portal vein. Those three structures lie within the free edge of the lesser omentum. If one were to insert a finger just behind the free edge of the lesser omentum, following the track of this arrow here, you can see this arrow runs down then behind the lesser omentum, then the tip of that arrow, or the tip of, one, or the tip of one's finger, would then be resting in the lesser sac and it would be entering the lesser sac through this narrowed area over here, which was referred to as the epiploic foramen. So this region over here is in the greater sac. If one takes one fing one's finger and puts it down then behind the lesser omentum, one's going into the lesser sac. So the lesser sac is merely a continuation of the greater sac, continuous through the epiploic foramen. The epiploic foramen is not an actual hole, it's just an evagination from the greater sac, rather like the finger of a glove, when looked at from the inside, appears to be going through a hole to form the finger. It's all part of one glove, it's not actually a hole, but rather an evagination. In this posterior view of the liver, you can see the right lobe over here, left lobe here, Chordate lobe here and quadrate lobe here. While this region over here, oh, that's a cool noise. This region over here, the blue area, represents the uh, lesser omentum, which will run across and attach to that point over there that we're familiar with. So, just to draw that in a little more clearly, this bit over here represents that bit over there, and that is the lesser omentum. You can see on the posterior view also the um, ligamentum teres, which is this structure over here, this structure over here, and the little bit of the falciform ligament is just peeping through at that point there. This brings us to uh, another important point uh, of, the, of the view of the liver from behind, and that is this area here, which is known as the bear area. The bear area. And it's bare because 
the peritoneum as it runs around deflects off the superior surface of the liver there, the posterior superior surface of the liver and this darker brown bit uh, over here lies right up against the posterior superior abdominal wall and is not separated from the posterior abdominal wall then by peritoneum. So most of the liver here you can see is intraperitoneal but this little bit over here is retroperitoneal. By the way, uh, this region over here is known as the uh, porta hepatis, all this region in here. Porta meaning gateway and or gate, and hepatis meaning to the liver. And here you can see the free edge of the lesser amentum containing biliary system, which has got a hepatic system here. Uh, beg your pardon, biliary system here. So this is the cystic duct running up into here. And just next to it is going to be the uh, hepatic duct. And these two, a little lower down in the diagram, would be joining about over here to form the common bile duct. Over here is the portal vein, carrying blood from the GIT into the liver. And over here is the hepatic artery that's carrying blood from the celiac trunk to go and give blood, uh, oxygenated blood to the liver. Uh, also coming in and out uh, in this region here are uh, nerves and uh, lymphatics and uh, lymph nodes in this region can also become enlarged um, for a variety of reasons which in turn can put pressure onto the uh, extra hepatic system over here and cause biliary obstruction and give rise to jaundice. So this is an important area for many reasons. And just for the sake of thoroughness, I presume you've all realized that this is the inferior vena cava. Let's now look at all this information in the form of a sagittal or parasagittal section. Uh, in this uh, diagram over here, we've got the liver up at the top, we've got the stomach, we've got the transverse colon, over here we're going to have the pancreas and over there the duodenum over here is going to be the rectus sigmoid and this bit over here is going to be small intestine the, let me just write that as a little, a little clearer there for a P for a pancreas the area of the greatest sac is all the cyan colored material here wherever the cyan color is this all represents the greater sac. Uh, while this darker blue color here represents the region of the lesser sac. And this is the same color coding system that we used before where the dark blue color here represents the lesser sac in both diagrams and the light colour, the cyan colour, represents the greater sac in both diagrams. In the diagram uh, above over here, remember that we get access to the lesser sac by going behind the lesser omentum, and this is the lesser omentum running along here in this diagram, the lesser omentum running from the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach. That's the lesser curvature of the stomach, that's the lesser omentum. So the area posterior to the lesser omentum is the lesser sac. So when our finger comes in this direction here, behind the lesser omentum, it's going straight into the lesser sac. Um, it, does so, it does so going through the epiploic foramen, and the epiploic foramen on this diagram is represented by this little hole, perhaps a little higher up than shown in the left-hand diagram, but that little hole there uh, is the representative of the epiploic foramen on this view. So one's finger would come in through the epiploic foramen and into the lesser sac. Now to describe where the lesser sac is, we would say that it's behind the lesser omentum, running down from the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach. So it's posterior to the lesser omentum, it's posterior to the stomach, it's anterior to the pancreas, it extends up 
posteriorly behind the liver and one can access the lesser sac through the lesser uh, through the uh, epiploic foramen which on this diagram is shown by this hole here so that narrowing over there looks a little bit lower on this diagram here than it does on uh, this part over here but those two are supposed to be representing the same thing and the fold, the bigger part of the sac continues down into the folds of peritoneum that form the greater omentum. In practice, this greater omentum all fuses up into one thin layer as the peritoneum comes off the greater curve of the stomach and folds back on itself. This all fuses up into one thin layer. So if you try to get your finger down in between the layers of the greater omentum, it'll probably get stuck round about here. But in any event, you can see that's where the greater, uh, a bigger part, that's where the lesser sac is. Looking at on this diagram over here, posterior to the lesser omentum, running behind where the liver is, and it's posterior to where the stomach lies. So just one last small thing before we finish. Let's just go and have a closer look at this diagram here, just so that we can see the relationship between the greater and lesser omentum. Then let's just draw in a schematic liver there, and a schematic stomach here. We'll then use blue to join a connection between liver and stomach, and that is two layers of peritoneum forming the lesser omentum. These two layers then split and go around the stomach like that and then come off on the greater curvature on the other side like that to drop down to form the greater omentum and then fall back on themselves like this to go off and do what they've got to do and this over here then represents, let me just get a black colour here, this then here represents the greater omentum. Like that. That's the greater omentum. Now on this diagram here, uh, towards the left, that means that the lesser omentum runs across between stomach and liver, or between liver and duodenum. And the two layers separate, one coming around the front, like that, other one coming around the back, like that. And they then peel off, dropping down in front of the abdomen, arising off the greater curvature of the stomach here and then going on to form the greater omentum as it dangles down in front of the abdominal cavity. And that's what we see when we first open the anterior abdominal wall. Now I know that this might seem quite a lot of detail, but really what I've tried to do is tell a story, a story of the abdomen how one big space gets separated into a number of smaller spaces which are all interconnected. The most important spaces are the greater sac and the lesser sac and how there is continuity between the lesser sac and the greater sac through the epiploic foramen. You also know something about the greater omentum. The greater omentum can be very important in sealing off inflammatory processes in the abdomen. It also acts as a trap for cancer cells, for example, in tumours that like to spread in the salomic cavity, spreading transcellomically, such as ovarian carcinoma. They can trap, uh, the cells can be trapped by the greater omentum, and it might be necessary to remove it. This slide marks the end of this presentation.